Hello, my name is Linda and I'm with the UNM Office of the IRB. Today I'm presenting a workshop on writing the IRB protocol and consent form. Our objectives today are to understand the components of the IRB protocol and how they apply to your research, to review both the required and additional elements of consent as defined by the federal regulations, and to learn the types of waivers and informed consent that can be granted by the IRB. So first, what is a protocol? The protocol is a document that describes the background and rationale for conducting the research. It also provides detailed information on the study design, the methodology, and other information about the project. It's a living source document that may be amended over the course of the study as things change. So in the protocol, you want to start with, what is your question? How are you going to find the answer? We have a background and scientific rationale section where we want you to describe your research question and provide the rationale for conducting the research. This is not a scientific publication, nor is it your dissertation. So please keep this section brief, usually limited to one to two paragraphs. We also want you to find your objectives and aims for the study. Define your research objectives, your specific aims, or your hypotheses. And then we talk about the study design. In the study design, we ask you to define your target population and to list any inclusion exclusion criteria that might apply to that population. If you're going to include vulnerable populations, please make sure you detail what populations you're going to include. And later, we are going to ask you to describe any additional protections that are required in order to conduct research with those individuals. For more information about vulnerable populations, you can reference our SOP on conducting research with vulnerable populations, or you can visit our research handbook online. In the recruitment and screening section, we want you to outline where and how you're going to recruit individuals into your study. If you're only working with existing data, we want you to describe how you're gonna access any private information that you're gonna use for research purposes. Describe the procedures you will use to foster equitable selection of subjects and describe what information will be accessed or used for research purposes. If you're gonna screen potential participants by using either online surveys, a phone call, um, please describe that in your protocol and also include any actual recruitment materials that will be used, such as flyers, uh, emails that might be sent out, letters, uh, as well as any kind of posting you're going to put on social media. Next, we go into the informed consent procedures. How are you going to consent interested individuals? Informed consent is a process, and it's the process of providing information to potential research participants and answering any questions that they have about the study. Um, we want to know if you will obtain informed consent and, and whether you will document informed consent. We also want to know how you will protect participant privacy during the informed consent discussion. The IRB has the ability to grant a waiver of informed consent in the case where there's no interaction with the participants or a waiver of documentation where you don't obtain signature on the form, depending on the nature of the research. And I will cover that more towards the end of the presentation. If you're gonna include non-English speaking individuals in your study, the informed consent discussion and the actual form being provided must pre be presented in the language that is understood by the participant or participants. If there's multiple languages, then these forms will need to be translated into those languages. Um, we also have a translation certificate, uh, certification form online that you will need to submit if you're translating documents. If you're working with cognitively impaired individuals, we will need to describe the process of how you will determine if the individual is capable of providing informed consent, as well as any procedures you have for obtaining consent from the individual and or their legally authorized representative. Next is the data collection procedures. This is really describing what will happen to the participant in the study. 
We'd like you to provide a thorough sequential description of all research procedures and participant activities, including what participants will be asked to do, how many sessions are required to participate in the research and how long each session is anticipated to last, how and where the information will be collected and stored, whether private education or medical records might be accessed because these have further federal protections beyond uh, the common rule, whether biospecimens will be collected and how much uh, of them will be collected, and whether any type of drug or device will be used. This, session, this section of the protocol should really go into detail uh, about what will happen during the entire course of the study uh, during the data collection period. We also want to know where the study is going to take place. Uh, you have to think about the study locations that are involved. We want you to describe any sites or locations where the research will take place. Um, if you are using external sites to access private information or to conduct actual research activities, we will ask for letters of support from those organizations to ensure that they are um, knowledgeable about the research and commit to supporting the activities that are being proposed. We would also want you to describe any site-specific requirements that might be in place or ethical review requirements. And this includes working with international sites. Um, if you need more information about this, please contact our office. Um, we have plenty of information to provide you um, about letters of support when they're required uh, and when other IRBs might need to be involved in the study. The next section of the protocol is talking about the potential risks of harm to individuals, as well as any possibility for benefit. So the risks, we want you to describe all possible risks of harm that could occur, and these could be psychological, physical, social, economic, or legal. Um, if there's any risk of harm to communities, if this is a community-based project, we want to understand that. You will need to describe both their likelihood and their seriousness. We want a plan to prevent any identified risks of harm. And if the project is greater than minimal risk, you will need to provide a data and safety monitoring plan. And you can find more information about data and, software, data and safety monitoring plans on our website. In the benefits section, we really want you to talk about any uh, direct benefits that are anticipated uh, to individual participants. Um, if there is no direct benefit anticipated, such as completing a survey, um, then clearly indicate that there's no direct benefit uh, to individual participants, but we do want you to describe the anticipated societal benefit of the research. So how will you maintain privacy and confidentiality during uh, the course of the research? Privacy protection is very important. Um, we really want you to think about protecting participant privacy during all courses of the research, including recruitment, informed consent, data collection. Um, think about where procedures will be conducted, whether they'll be in a private setting or, or in a more public space. Um, that information uh, needs to be upfront and uh, just also described in the consent form. Um, and really the setting in which the participant will be interacting with the research. If you are conducting focus groups where there's gonna be multiple participants together, um, you need to think about what privacy considerations are in place there and make sure that you inform participants that there is some uh, risk of loss of privacy in a group setting. When you're thinking about data confidentiality, we want you to really think about how you're gonna manage and store the data. We want to make sure it's uh, secure and that it's uh, stored properly, not only during the participant's involvement, but also once uh, the participant data collection is ended and you are in data analysis. Um, research data should be de-identified and stored in a de-identified manner using study IDs or other methods. Um, and we want you to think about what will be done with any audio, video, or digital records uh, that might be collected after the project is completed. The protocol also needs to describe what will happen if something goes wrong. So you, there are reporting procedures 
that are detailed in the researcher handbook and in our policies on the website. Um, in the protocol, we want you to describe what procedures will be in place to report problems such as complaints from participants that are unresolved by the research team, protocol and consent deviations, any unanticipated problems to participants or others, adverse events, and you also need to consider whether uh, reporting their reporting requirements to agencies outside of the UNMIRB, uh, such as funding agencies such as NIH or NSF. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the consent form. Uh, the, we talked earlier about the informed consent process. The consent form is really a supplement to that. And it's a document that contains written information that's presented to potential research participants to help them understand whether they want to participate in the project. It also uh, provides contact information for both the research team as well as the IRB in case there are problems uh, or they would like to talk to someone to have their questions answered. It should be written in a clear, concise manner at the reading level of the expected participants. So the required elements of consent are defined in the federal regulations. The, the consent form and the informed consent discussion must contain a statement that, the, that it is research being conducted, uh, what the purpose, duration, and procedures of the research will be, any uh, foreseeable, reasonably foreseeable risks and benefits, a description of how data confidentiality will be maintained, um, an explanation as to whether there is any compensation for participation, which is not to be listed as a benefit to the research, but as a separate uh, section of the consent form. Information on whom to contact about answers, uh, to get answers, excuse me, uh, for questions about the research or their rights, um, a statement that the participation in the research is voluntary, and um, any intention for use of uh, future use of data. A key information section is also required by the regulations. This is usually at the beginning of the consent, but this is only required for more complex studies in which it is important to bring some of the more important information to the front of the um, consent form. In most cases for studies conducted on the main campus, consent forms are typically one to two pages and do not require a key information section. There are also additional elements of consent um, that, are, that can be put in a consent form under federal regulations. Typically, these are only done for greater than minimal risk studies, but there are times when an IRB may require these to be put in uh, to the consent. Um, a statement that there are unforeseen risks that are not yet identified. Uh, circumstances when partition, participation may be ended by the research team as opposed to the individuals. Any cost to participating. Um, if it's a drug or device study, if there are procedures that the participant would have to go through in order to withdraw safely, um, a statement of any new findings that may impact their willingness to participate, the approximate number of participants, whether there is any potential for commercial profit from the research, any return of clinically relevant results to participants, and whether genome sequences genome sequencing will be done as part of the research project. These again are typically not required in consent forms that are uh, reviewed by our IRB, um, so just keep that in mind. I want to show you an example of very simple consent um, that we recommend you use when appropriate. Um, it's, as you can see, it's just a one-page consent form. We usually recommend that this be used with surveys or interviews or focus groups. Um, it does contain all of the required elements we discussed, but it keeps it very simple. Um, this would be modified to be specific to what you are doing. Um, so this is just recommended language. And, and in this case, because there are no signature lines, you would be requesting a waiver of documentation of consent. And I'm just gonna to touch on that briefly on the next slide. So waivers of informed consent, uh, there are two types. There's a, what we call a, a complete waiver of informed consent. And this uh, waives the whole process entirely. So there is no direct communication with participants. 
And it's really the least common type of waiver granted um, and is typically reserved for when researchers are simply accessing private records, uh, such as medical records or education records, or observing behaviors of large groups of people where it would be um, impracticable to get informed consent from each individual. More often, our IRB grants waiver of consent documentation, and this is when there's no requirement that a participant sign the consent form. So they would still be provided a document, a brief, like the one I showed you in the last slide. Um, there could still be a verbal uh, exchange of information, but there would be no required signature that would be uh, collected and kept by the research team. Um, so this is used very commonly when you're conducting online surveys, for example, um, when they're simply provided a consent document at the beginning of the survey, and then they would click uh, that I agree to continue. So if you are going to request this kind of, uh, either of these types of, of waivers, you need to uh, make that request in the protocol document and provide justification for these waivers. In this slide, I'm going to quickly go through uh, the requirements that you would have to justify for each type of waiver. Uh, for a waiver of informed consent, uh, the research must be minimal risk. Uh, the research, uh, the waiver of informed consent must not adversely affect the rights and welfare of the participants. The research could not practically be conducted without the waiver. Um, if you are requesting access to identifiable private information or biospecimens, you have to justify why the research can't be carried out without access to identifiable biospecimens and data. And if appropriate, participants would need to be provided with additional pertinent information after participation. That rarely is required, um, but it does come up in certain types of emergency research. Um, Next are the criteria for waiver of documentation of consent. Um, while on the complete waiver of consent, all five of those have to be met. For the waiver of documentation of consent, you just need to meet one of these criteria. The first one um, is by far the most common one, and that's when the research is minimal risk um, and involves, that should say minimal risk of harm, and involves no procedures for which written consent is normally required outside of the research context, such as completing a survey. Assign, the other uh, option would be a signed consent form would be the only record linking the participant in the project, and the breach of confidentiality would be the principal risk. Um, note that this does not have a minimal risk requirement built into it. Um, and typically this type of documentation waiver is granted if there's a collection of very sensitive data uh, or if it's um, just participation in the research could be stigmatizing in any way. The final criteria for waiver of documentation consent, um, which is fairly new in the regulations, is um, for participants or legally authorized representatives that are a member of a distinct cultural group or community where signing a form is not normal. Um, the research is minimal risk and an appropriate alternative mechanism for document informed consent will be obtained, such as a fingerprint or an X. So this is typically used with, um, we see this request come in if you're working with indigenous populations or with uh, international tribes or people who are not used to signing forms or that signing a consent form would um, be fearful to them or present some kind of problem. So all of our templates are on our website. Um, you can find us at irb.unm.edu. Uh, we have uh, consultations available. If you are working on your submission and would like to talk to someone in our office, um, please request a consult and we will get that scheduled with you. And that is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time today and have a good day.